That was beautiful. Good morning. Welcome to worship of the United Presbyterian Church of Binghamton. It is good to be here together in person and electronically. And I hope that in this time of worship, we all find our hearts touched and our spirits moved by Christ's presence among us. I am Cindy Berger, and I am serving as the liturgist this morning. If you are able, please stay after worship for a time of fellowship. Coffee and tea are available in the front of the sanctuary. We will have the Zoom monitor set up there so those who are worshiping at a distance can join us. As Advent begins, we start by acknowledging the weariness, grief, rage, and hopelessness we carry. And we also affirm that we are made for joy. We start this season with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They have battled infertility and have lived many years. Perhaps they feel the weight of hopes and dreams unattained. The angel comes to Zechariah with a promise of good news, but Zechariah cannot fully receive it. Sometimes weariness can harden us and prevent us from living fully. Let us acknowledge the ways that we too are hardened by disbelief. Like the psalmist, let us ask, how long, and plead for restoration. The theme image that is on the worship guide and will be shown on the live stream comes from the sanctified art curriculum that we are using for this season of Advent this year. It's called, titled, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? Many of our prayers this morning are also from this curriculum, as is the devotional mini booklet that is in your worship guide. Let us call ourselves to worship responsively, using the words found in your worship guide or on your screen. In God's house, we can be joyful. We can be grateful. We can be hopeful. In God's house, we can be weary. We can be anxious. We can be grieving. In God's house, we can be honest, inspired or tired, delighted or doubtful, connected or curious, and everything in between. This is God's house. You are welcome exactly as you are. Let us worship our loving God. Our song of gathering is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And it is found on page four of your worship guide or on your screen.
join me as we pray our gathering prayer responsively. Gracious God, we are weary. For weary bodies that ache and cry out, we pray, save us from pushing ourselves too hard. Remind us that we deserve Sabbath rest. For weary minds that feel overwhelmed and saturated with news, we pray, save us from the distractions that bombard us. Remind us that in the quiet, we can hear you. For weary hearts that long to feel the joy of this season, we pray, save us from impatience with ourselves or others. Remind us that healing takes time and that joy and grief can coexist. For the weary edges of our faith that struggle to hold on to hope, remind us of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Remind us that your good news knows no bounds. Amen. Our first lesson is from the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, and we will read it responsively. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord, Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine that we may be saved. That's okay. <gasps> Yay! Okay, so it's almost Christmas. And what do we call the time that we use when we're getting ready for Christmas? Do you know? Daddy knows. Daddy was trying to make Clyde look smart by whispering the answer to him. You're smart even if you don't know the word yet. The word is Advent. 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 And you know what Advent means? It is a weird word. It means beginning. So it's the beginning of Christmas. Christmas. Great. And what's Christmas? The day we celebrate Jesus' birthday. We think Jesus is about 2,029 2, this year. Something like that. It's a big number. But one of the things we do to get ready is to count. We count how long it is until it's time for Jesus' birthday. And we do that with this. What's this? Candle 
It's called a wreath. This is a wreath. Well, we put the candles in the wreath because you can't make four candles into a round shape very well. And the reason that we have a round shape that is green is because there's not much that's green out there right now. It's all kind of gray and brown and kind of boring looking. But then there are these certain kinds of plants that always stay green. And we say that's a reminder that new life is coming and new stuff is going to happen. So we make our wreath green with green plants and we make it round like God holding and hugging the whole world and we put candles in it and each week we're going to light a different candle because we're going to get closer to Christmas, that's right. And on the last Sunday, the fourth Sunday, there'll be four candles and then on Christmas Eve we're going to put a candle right in the middle and that's going to be the Jesus candle. Yeah, it'll be so exciting. And so I need to get my little worship guide so that I can help people read stuff. And then would you like to help me light the first candle? Okay, come on over. The first one we're going to light, wait a minute, I always have to count. One, two, three, because the third one is always pink. So we're going to light this one. And, well, yeah, this week we're only lighting the first one, and Declan, I think you might be a little too short. Let's see. Let me get the, let me get the stool. Hang on. All right. Yeah, it's all the way up there. But you can't see all the way up there, and if you're going to help light, you've got to be able to see. It's true. You're taller than Declan. Let's put Declan up first. Okay. And then you can get up on the one behind him. That would be even higher. That's right. All right. Okay, that's good. Now, everybody grab. You have to push two at once. It's very exciting. So you push the black one up here. No, the one on top up here, buddy. Me? Yeah, you push that one. And I'll push this one, and let's see if we can do this. You better let me push the one on the bottom. There we go. Everybody ready? Okay, good job. Isn't that pretty? Troublemaker. And now, what do you think we're going to do now? You can whistle now? Very cool. I think now we're going to say a prayer. Oh! I want to do it. It's Dad's fault. He told him to. All right, get down, Declan, because we're going to have a prayer. The prayer is responsive. It is in your worship guide under the Time for the Young at Heart. All the way up here. How does a worry, weary world hope? By telling stories of hope, by lighting candles in the night, and planting seeds in the winter that will bloom in the spring. By praying for children as they grow and picking up trash on the sidewalk. By insisting that small acts can make a difference. There are a million ways to practice hope. So today we light the candle of hope as a reminder and a promise. With God's help, we bring hope into a weary world. Amen. And next week I'm going to say, and what's the first candle? And you can say the candle of hope. What you just lit is the candle of hope. Hope, peace, joy, love are the four candles. And then Jesus. 
can't do better than that. You're going to write the next one? Okay. Sounds like a plan. Thanks for coming up. Yeah, we're going to have to get you a kneeler. <laughs> yes. Ayla's gotten so bright eyed. People of God, be welcome at the table, a place where heaven and earth collide. In the breaking of bread, where the promise of God is set free as we retell the story of our salvation. In the pouring of the cup, where the love of God is offered to all who long for the light. This is a generous place where no one is left hungry and everyone is made welcome. Come, let us gather in the name of the Lord and make this table our meeting place with our past and our present and all that is yet to be. Come now with your faith and your doubt. Come with your questions and your hopes. Come with your grief and your love. Just come because there is room for you here. This is Christ's table. Everyone is welcome. <clears throat> We remember the witness of Jesus to challenge the empires of the world, to stop at nothing to declare God's love for all people. We remember how the world responded to Jesus' ministry and teaching by killing him. And we remember God's bold challenge to the world in bringing Jesus back to life. And because of all this, we dare to remember the night when Christ was betrayed. Gathered at table with his closest followers, Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this, eat this. It is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. After supper, he took a cup and he gave thanks and he offered it saying, this is a cup of a new and everlasting covenant, poured out willingly and lovingly. Drink this and remember me. And so we remember and we reconnect with one another in this season. And as we invite Christ anew into our hearts, so we rededicate ourselves to proclaiming in word and deed Christ's realm. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of consecration. Bless us and bless these gifts. May the Spirit rest upon this time and this table, surrounded tenderly by our memories of saints as on sacred times and tables long ago, so that this loaf may be broken love and this cup a well of blessing. For we pray in the words of our ancestors that we claim as our own, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If your elements are with you, rest your hands lightly upon them to be if they are in the front of the sanctuary, open your hands to be sacramental, filled with the power to change your heart and the world. We ask God's grace on us and on all those who are in our prayer list this morning, and God's blessing on our elements and our hands. We break the bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God, God here among, among us, light, light in, in the, the midst, midst of us, us Bring, bring to us delight and life. 
we are welcome to this gift of God, the cup of blessing. God's, God's love, love is poured, poured out with, with love and abundance. And Let us pray together the prayer after the meal. Holy God, you have fed, fed us all out of your own generous and gracious hands. From, from them we have received welcome, nourishment, hope, and consolation. 
May these things grow in us, alongside the gift of faith, so that we may plant their seeds in the world around us. Through the Holy Spirit, guide us in the days ahead to follow your light as you lead us in your great and ongoing story of resurrection, redemption, and restoration through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. They don't say. The focus lesson today is from the first chapter of Luke, and I'll be reading the first 23 verses. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who have from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, as one having a grasp of everything from the start, to write a well-ordered account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have a firm grasp of the words in which you have been instructed. <clears throat> in the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as a priest before God during his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I know that this will happen? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. <clears throat> but now, because you did not believe me, believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he returned to his home. We don't hear the story of Zechariah very often because there are so many other stories to tell, and it's sort of hard to figure out how you fit this one into all of the other stuff that goes with getting ready for Christmas. And so we tend to jump from this story to the blessing in the temple when Zechariah finally meets baby Jesus and speaks a word of joy. And we leave out the part at the beginning. Theophilus, by the way, means God lover, lover of God. So when Luke says, I'm going to write this down so that you, most excellent Theophilus, might know, 
He's talking to all of us as lovers of God. And he's trying to get it all set out in a way that we can all understand that good things are coming. Luke is writing probably after the fall of the temple, but he's writing about the period between temples, and he's writing about a time when people had been waiting for good news for a long time. And he's writing about what it feels like to continually be in the temple and serving God and doing all the stuff you're supposed to do and wondering what will happen to you because you're tired, the world seems to be a mess, If you're Zechariah and Elizabeth, you don't have children, so you don't have any kind of social security. And you're doing your best, but you're looking around and you're saying, how long, oh Lord? How long am I gonna do this? How long are you gonna hang out in whatever heavenly realm you are and just sort of let the world fall apart, because that's kind of what it feels like. At least for me right now, it kind of feels like the world's falling apart. Actually, one day I said it was like um, somebody had stuffed a whole lot of stuff in a blender and then didn't put the lid on before they turned it on. And so I was just kind of watching stuff fly around. (laughs) The world is so busy and so complicated and so full of challenges to all kinds of faith that when we hear again, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, which means God with us, will come to you. It's hard to imagine where that joy is going to come from. And so we see Zechariah doing his thing. He's been He's part of a group of koanim, of of, of priests who rotate through the temple and do service periodically. And there are so many priests at this point because the priestly caste is a hereditary thing that they have to choose who's going to offer the sacrifices um, by casting lots. And the lot has fallen on him to do the incense offering that day. So he goes into the sanctuary where the incense altar is and he's offering the thing and an angel appears and like everybody else who has an angelic appearance come to them he's terrified and so the angel speaks again the words that are the most common words repeated in the bible do not be afraid for i have heard And the Lord has heard your prayers. There's nothing that tells us that Zechariah was praying for a child. In fact, it's probably pretty fair to guess that Zechariah has more or less given up on the idea that he would have a child. He's an older guy, past his prime. His wife has not been able to conceive. They always blame the woman for that, by the way. There's never a possibility that it was male infertility because, well, you know. Anyway, so when an angel comes to him and says, I've heard your prayers, Zechariah says, wow. And then the angel says, and your wife is going to conceive and have a son, and his name will be John, and he will be a forerunner of God to bring people home and give them new possibilities and new hope in the one God. And Zechariah says, huh? At least that's how I imagine it. I mean, he's probably not even sure at that point that it's good news because as we've said, if somebody said to me, Kimberly, in nine months you're going to give birth to a brand new baby, I don't think I'd think that was good news. 
Not that I don't love babies. I love babies. My grandchildren bring me great joy, but I'm past being a new mom. So Zechariah is not sure that this is hopeful anyway. <laughs> and he also wonders exactly what the mechanics of it are all going to be. And the angel's not giving him any help with that. And he's so stuck that he can't imagine that God can make a way. And so the angel says to him, since you can't believe what you're hearing, you're not going to be able to talk until the baby is born. And there's kind of a comic element to it because now we've got this priest whose job, after all it is, to spout blessings and talk to people and say prayers and can't talk. And so he's, we're told, left to gesture to try to tell people what's going on. And wouldn't it be fun to find out what the conversation with him and Elizabeth was that night? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> and... I've heard that preached over and over again as if it was a punishment that Zechariah has words taken away for a while. But I wonder, first of all, if that isn't a way to find rest. And second of all, if sometimes the reason we can't see or hear or find hope is that we're not watching and listening in the places that hope happens. So maybe, just maybe, Zechariah is given this time of waiting, this time of quiet, this time of silence, so that he can see and hear and feel another new world being born all around him. It's noticeable that Luke starts out saying, I'm going to give you the word about the word, and these are the words that I'm going to tell you that you're going to understand because these words are the words that we got from the people who give us the words. All of that is right there in the first couple of verses. I'm not making it up. <laughs> and then the first thing that happens is the words go away, and Zechariah is left to listen and maybe to perceive in different ways for a while. We're going to talk more about Elizabeth next week, so I'm not going to spend much time worrying about Elizabeth this morning, but I do think that one of the things we tend to do is to tell stories, and to tell ourselves things we already know, and to remind ourselves over and over again of the things that are true in our world. And sometimes I think because we're so busy telling the same things over and over again, we can't hear when something new is beginning. Um, people who know more about science than I do would be able to tell you what it's called, but there's apparently a, um, a perspective in the scientific world that says that if you don't already know it's there, you can't see it. That is, you will have all kinds of data in front of you but you don't know what it means until you have created in your mind a thought or a pattern that allows you to see what's happening in front of you. And I think that's just fascinating because have you ever seen those 
YouTube videos where there's a, a, a giant ape guy in an ape costume walking around in a party. And you can watch the whole thing and never have seen that ape. And nobody in the party appears to have seen the ape either because you're not looking for him. You're looking at whatever the story on the thing is, and nobody's telling you, hey, watch out for this ape, so you don't see it. What is it that we ought to be looking for that we haven't known was there? And we've been so busy telling the stories that we can't see what's going on in front of us. Most of the stories going on right now, we all know how they play out. Blah, 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 conflict, blah, 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 chaos, blah, 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 tragedy, death, horror. We get overwhelmed and we get numb and we get stuck because it's all so very bleak. And I always think that there's something really weird about deciding that you're going to have a holiday that's based on expecting something new in December. Because December is blah. It's gray. At the moment, it's rainy, thank goodness, because it could be raining, it could be snowing, and I don't want that much snow right now. And we say, Something new is coming, and it's time to get ready. And like Zechariah, I think we say, huh? But something new is always coming, because God never, ever leaves us alone. And if we're not preparing our hearts, if we're not watching, if we're not looking, if we're not shutting up to listen, how are we ever going to know what the new thing is that God is doing? So I don't think that the angel Gabriel was telling Zechariah he'd been punished when they told him to shut up. I think the angel Gabriel was giving Zechariah some space and some grace to hear Most of you all can't hear what I can hear over here, but there's a soft toy that has a music box in it that can't be turned off. And so actually I think Amanda may have leapt up and run, run out with it, but it makes this little sound. And I think sometimes that hope is like that. There's this little sound or song in the world that can't be drowned out completely, but that we tend to get deaf to because we're too busy listening to the other voices. And so it's useful to stop and hear something different in this season. Not because it takes away all of the problems or it solves any of the conundrums or it keeps us on the right path necessarily or anything else, but because we're tired and we're weary and it's good to know that the song goes on even when we're not the ones who are singing or playing. Um... The other thing I wanted to say, I suppose, was about um, the relationship between the text we just, I just talked about and the psalm that we read this morning. Because the psalm that we read this morning is of the genre called lament. It's basically the worshiping community hollering at God and saying, God, could you use a little help here? Are you going to, like, just withhold all the blessings forever, or are you going to come do what we need you to do? And that's a kind of faithfulness we don't talk about very much, and I'm not going to talk about it very much this morning either, except 
Whatever you're feeling is fair game in a relationship with God because God can take it. When they say that Zechariah and Elizabeth are righteous and faithful people who live faithfully in the law, that doesn't mean they're pretending to be good enough for God because God knows. It means they do their best and they trust God when they can't quite get there by themselves. And they have enough of a relationship with God that they can say, I don't like this, it isn't fair, why is this happening? And trust that God will say something. In the case of Zechariah, the angel says, listen, don't talk. In fact, don't talk for the next nine months. Just listen. And maybe, if you're listening, you will hear the voice of promise, the voice of hope, the voice of possibility, the voice of comfort. Amen. Our song of response is on page nine of your worship guide. Comfort, comfort now my people. Join me now as we say what we believe using the affirmation of faith, which begins on page eight of your worship guide. We believe in a God who hears our prayers, who knows the shape and form of our weariness, 
We believe in a God who wants joy and life for us, not just survival and existence. We believe in a God who looks ahead, who is not done dreaming for the world. A God who sends hope in the form of people and change, movements and spirit. And so we return to this space. We bring our joy and our weariness like two sides of the same coin. And we trust that God is already at work. Yes, we believe in a God who hears our prayers. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. And now we all have the opportunity to respond to God's love with our gifts. If you would like to offer your time or talent to enhance our worship or strengthen our mission here at UPC, look through the worship guide for ways that you can join UPC's ministries or contact the church office. If you are in a position to make a monetary offering to further God's work here at UPC, you can leave your offering on a plate by any of the doors or you can send a check in the mail or make an online donation. And so now, because God has been so good to us, let us return our gifts and our offerings. Join me now in our prayer of dedication, which is found on page 10 in your worship guide or on your screen. 
loving God, we know that ministry is not a service we receive at church, so much as it is a life-giving work you call us to do with others. Use our gifts and our talents, blended with the gifts and talents of others around the world, to make a difference in our lives and the lives of others. Amen. Lots of announcements this morning. Um, since it fell out of the folder, I will share with you the Nuke Porfe um, Elikim's classes um, semester celebration will be Friday, December 8th at 6.30 at Atomic Toms. And on the back of that is the announcement about the toy drive um, that the Citizen Action folks have been doing last year. They collected over soon and distributed over 600 toys and they have already started coming in if you want to be a part of that. There are ways to do that on the flyer. Um, we still have four tags left from, um, for the silver bells, which are gifts to older adults who might otherwise not get presents. And um, those presents are starting to come ro rolling in too, so we're excited about that. Um, I'm gonna let Becky tell you about what's happening today because she can. Um, so today, as you see in your uh, announcements, that there is like a choose your own adventure after worship today. Um, we need to decorate the sanctuary for Christmas. So the wreaths and things that are all downstairs need to come up and spread throughout the sanctuary to make it look a little more Christmassy. Um, we also need to be making some ornaments. Um, for the next three weeks, the next three Sundays, there will be ornament making things over here um, to make ornaments for our guests at the community meal. So there's little plastic balls that you can stick some stuff in and then clip the two sides together. Um, so they're not the glass ones this year, so we don't have to worry about them breaking. So they are uh, going to be over here. I just need to move the tables and the cart and put some stuff out. So um, if you are in uh, Bells, they will be practicing. So we will have some music as we decorate and make uh, ornaments. So uh, there are three different things going on right after worship today, and we hope that you join us. Thanks. Well, and the other thing that goes on after worship every week is there's coffee available and juice, and hopefully we'll talk to each other because we like to do that. Um, most of the other announcements in the worship guide today are um, happenings around the presbytery, which is one of the cool things about being a Presbyterian is that you're connected to other Presbyterians and have the opportunity to um, share together with different things at different times. Um, but I also want to let you know that today being the 3rd of December means that the fourth Sunday in Advent is also Christmas Eve this year. And we are going to have both a morning service at 10 a.m. and an afternoon service um, which I think we solidified at 4.30? 4. It was, misprinted as it was misprinted as 4.30, but it is in fact at 4. The 10 o'clock service is going to be um, informal. We hope fun. We're going to retell the story of Jesus by having a come-as-you-are Christmas pageant. We're not going to have any rehearsals. We're going to have small props that you can pick up when you come in and when it's your turn, you'll be invited to come up and be part of the, the, the pageant on the stage and we'll sing lots of Christmas carols and hopefully celebrate Jesus' birthday in ways that are fun. And then we'll have the traditional communion candlelight carol service at four. I think those are all the announcements we need to make. <gasps> nope, I'm wrong. Raya and then Sharon. This is just, um, sorry. Um, so the Binghamton University Opera performances are today, um, and I'm in that. Uh, so at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m., Hansel and Gretel. Um, I believe it's like $5 for adults, so it's not too expensive. 10? Okay, cool. 
Um, so it's a little more expensive. No, it's a little ways. It is still not that bad. Um, and I'm in the cast at 1 p.m. I'm not in the cast at 4 p.m. But also at 4 p.m., um, the Binghamton Madrigal Choir is having um, their Christmas uh, carols and lessons concert, and that's at Holy Trinity Catholic Church uh, on Prospect Street. So both both of those things are happening today. So if you're looking for any more music, um, there's a lot. <laughs> Well, not to compete with that, but my grandson Aiden is singing in the select choir today at 2.30 at Seton Catholic. Um, I think it's going to be a, a fairly quick little concert, and it's free, so it's at 2.30, so you could still hit the 4 o'clock show. Huh? That's what happens when you have a bunch of musicians in the congregation. <laughs> hey, uh... Uh, next Saturday, Downtown Singers is doing Messiah's performance at Sarah Jane Johnson Memorial United Methodist Church. Tickets are $20 and can be purchased at the door. 7.30. I think that's all of that information. I have, from time to time, had clients at the food pantry or the community meal comment about how every year between Thanksgiving and uh, New Year's, they get sort of bombarded with turkeys and food and baskets and things, and they kind of wonder what would happen if some of that stuff happened in July instead. <laughs> what do you think would happen if we were celebrating in July, too? Wouldn't that be something? I feel really lucky to be in a community where we have the kind of music we do and this much music, and I'm not saying anything else except, wow, how do you even decide who to go here today? It's a lot. Onward. <clears throat> the Song of Sending is Christ for the World We Sing. It's on, at least in my worship guide, it's on an insert. Family of faith, as you leave this place, you go into a weary world, so speak tenderly, 
Do the good that is yours to do. Choose connection. Hold on to hope. And remember that Christ took on flesh for you. You are God's beloved. So go rejoicing. The world needs it. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Peace be with you. Okay.